Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Marion County Espresso. I'm your host, Steve Woodhouse, and joining me today is Pella Mayor Don DeWard. Welcome, Don. Well, thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to come talk with you today. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. And we've discussed before the rec center. I've discussed it with other council members and people in the community lately. And it's still a hot topic. And I understand you want to get some more facts out there that people may have misunderstood. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we're taping this the day after the latest uh, bo uh, Board of Supervisors yes. meeting over at Marion County. And as everyone or most people know, we uh, approached the county about helping partnering with us on this project. And uh, so while some of that's fresh, I think it's good to have a conversation. There's a couple, uh, I'll call them allegations that have been yeah. made about the city council and about myself from a transparency standpoint, and I'd like to address those. Yes. And so uh, I have some, some information from meetings we had throughout the course of this whole process, uh, public meetings, information has been readily available to anybody that wants it. Uh, Monty has promised me that he will be able to superimpose yeah. <laughs> into the into the broadcast some screens mm -hmm. that uh, we used when we talked about it at the mm -hmm. city level. So if we want to start, let's start with the uh, supervisors meeting uh, of yesterday or we actually presented uh, three weeks ago to them our uh, request to, for $10 million of support for this project with them. Let me step back just a little bit and kind of explain why we ever went to the supervisors anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, up until four years ago, that probably wouldn't have been something that the city of Pella would have done. But uh, the supervisors have, have uh, and I think rightly so, have become interested in partnering with our cities in Marion County to do some projects uh, to help grow the county. Uh, and so, Back in 2020, and these these conversations started before I was mayor, back in 2019, I think. But in 2020, all the approvals happened where Pella, uh, the Prairie Ridge housing development out on the west end of town, uh, Marion County partnered with the city of Pella and did a urban renewal development out there where the county uh, put $4.5 million of Mm -hmm. county money into the uh, project for infrastructure. The whole idea was to create workforce housing. Because if you, uh, no one's, again, this won't be a surprise to anyone, but when you talk about uh, jobs and our employers, Marion County's done an unbelievable job of creating jobs over the last five or six years. And so the challenges that you hear from all of our industries, whether they're large or small, is workforce. Yes. Issues with not having enough workforce. And subheadings under that subject is, there are two things that keep popping up. Number one is housing. Yeah. Uh, affordable how you know, talk about affordable housing, workforce housing, there's all kinds of terms for it. But, um, you know, a housing study was done and just in Pella, there was, uh, back in 2016, said we needed 966 housing units in Pella by 2025, and so it was important that the city, and fortunately for us, the county agreed that we become proactive. Yeah. How do we create housing? Because the problem, some people misunderstand this, the problem was not demand, it was supply. And so we had to think about ways we could help create supply of housing for the incredible demand there was. and. You know, fast forward to now, there's no question that was the right way to look at it. Houses sell really fast. Yes, they do. They aren't on the market very long, and there's just not enough. Still, to this day, there's not enough inventory. So anyway, getting back to the discussion about how the county became involved, partner with the city of Pell on that project. Great project, incredibly successful project. It's way ahead of projections when the whole thing was was hatched uh, and discussed and approved. There's, uh, I think, as of yesterday, we have had 56 houses approved for the, for construction. Yeah, that, that was the figure Mike shared. Yeah. yeah, 40, I think 45 of them are in some state of construction. Yeah. Anyway, it's been a very successful pro, uh, pro, uh, project. And then the second project that happened along the way is in 2022, uh, Marion County, was able to secure the old VA pro, uh, 
site in yeah. in uh, Knoxville from the federal government, which that's not always easy to get that done, but they no, that they worked diligently, yeah. were able to uh, get control of that. And the county at that point, uh, back in 2022, uh, approved issuing um, $11 million of bond to uh, clear that property. Obviously, there was a lot of infrastructure, old infrastructure, and that needed to be cleared so that the site could become a development area. And so the county, uh, again, I, I think it was a great idea. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that the county's involved with our communities to help, cre uh, help fix some of these issues. So they, they invested $11 million in the uh, demolition of, that, of all the uh, infrastructure that was there. Now, I think, I you know, don't know all the details, but I'm pretty sure that they are in the process of, of selling lots now, the city of Knoxville, to start that development. Yeah, I've seen kind of a master plan for the whole site. It's pretty cool, I think. It, it, It'll be great it'll be for wonderful. Knoxville. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll be great for Marion County. So that was project number two. And then just now, in fact, I think just in the last couple months, the county is partnering with Pleasantville yeah. uh, on a project, a commercial development project along Highway 5 in Pleasantville. I think that's 2.6 million or 2.5 million that the county uh, is uh, has agreed to invest in that project with the city of Pleasantville. That's not finalized yet. It's not final. Yeah. yeah, it's mm -hmm. not final. They haven't actually mm -hmm. issued. I think there's some development. There's some agreements, and all of these required right. some agreements. Hey, county, we'll do this, but city, you have to do that. Exactly. Still. still so anyway, mm -hmm. so uh, with those things happening with the county support, it only seemed like a good idea to go talk to the county about partnering on this project because this is the same type of project. It's a project that's going to create an amenity in Pella that will work towards uh, attracting, retaining workforce. You go talk to, as I said, any employer, large or small in Pella or Knoxville or probably Pleasantville, one challenge, big challenge is workforce. So it made a lot of sense. So that's why we went there in the first yeah. place. I, as again, if these precedents hadn't been set, we may not have even thought of it. it but uh, that's why we, we said it. And I think at the meeting yesterday, I thought that uh, Mark Ramey did a really good job of laying out the reasons why mm -hmm. doing these types of projects are important for Marion County uh, and the reasoning behind it. And it, it's very sound, I think, with what uh, the goal is. And so... Uh, so what happened? We presented, uh, supervisors had a discussion, there was some public input at the first meeting. Yesterday we had another discussion only. I know there was a little friction between the <laughs> supervisors little, yeah. about whether it was just gonna be a discussion or actually an action item. Mm -hmm. It ended up, it was just a discussion. Again, uh, we didn't really do any presentation. I did talk a little bit about a couple things. Uh, and then there was some public input and then the supervisors expressed there, uh, again, no decision was made, but they expressed kind of where they were at. You heard quite a differing of opinion amongst the supervisors. Was, yep. uh, if you were there, and I, or you, I know you were there and listened in. And so, you know, what came out of that is, uh, uh, again, Mark, I think, did a great job of, of uh, laying the facts out there and how this would benefit Marion County. There was some hesitation and some issues that the other supervisors raised, which is Wonderful. That's how our decisions are made. Yeah. You, you. If you have concerns, you have questions, you get them answered. From a Pella standpoint, it's our responsibility to answer those questions. Uh, you know, with good, sound facts and judgments. So, that's where we're at. Uh, again, no decision was made. Uh, the indication probably was that a couple supervisors uh, to move this project forward would be interested in taking it to a vote, which. You know, in my opinion, I don't know why, because the first three projects, that did not happen. But for whatever reason, uh, as I think I said in the discussion yesterday, when you're in a position of leadership, uh, everybody else, it's real easy for everybody else to make a decision for you, but it's a lot harder when you actually have to make the decision. So that will be, that will be up to them. 
So and that's kind of where we stand uh, from the county. And you mentioned the other three. Um, I was at the meetings where they approved those projects and there were no public comments regarding it, no objections or that, well, at least not in the meetings. I don't know if they received emails or not. But. Yeah, and I, I made note of that. Mm -hmm. I went back and did a little research, found out when those projects were approved. And yes, in each public, all those projects require a public hearing. There was no public hearing at the time. Now they mm -hmm. kind of laughed a little bit when I said that, and I kind of retracted what I said that they didn't get any public input because I'm sure they did behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But no one, no one, stood up in the public no, uh, realm and said anything about it. They proved them and it went through. So so that's kind of, again, where we're at with the county. And I know that uh, one of the concerns that, that you know, even myself, I'm, I'm a conservative. I don't really like to see eminent domain used much. Yeah. And when the gentleman said that he didn't really want to sell the land to extend University Street, how, how would the city handle that? That's a great question. I know Keisha mm -hmm. uh, brought that up. Um, so as far as the county, let's look at it first from a county's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, to, to, in order to put the street in, that would be Pella. Pella would have to do yes. that. So very easily, if we did come to an agreement and partner on this, one of the clauses in the agreement could, would be, and I, for sure, it'd be fine, is that the county would not participate until the land for the street was secured and Pella owned it. Mm -hmm. So they would not do anything, but they certainly could require that we do that. Yeah. Okay? So no one is in favor of eminent domain that I know of. No. I mean, it's used, but no one really likes it. And so all I can say is um, there are three property owners that we would need to uh, buy some piece of ground from to put University Street in. Uh, and we are in the process of engineering that street so that we know exactly, you know, until you, until you know exactly what you need, it doesn't mm -hmm. make a lot of sense to me to go talk to somebody and say, well, maybe we're going to need an acre, or maybe it's... So we are in the process of gathering that information. We'll have it very soon. We will initially go to the landowners that are involved and start a discussion. And... Um, you know, where it ends up, I don't know. Potentially, if we have issues, we certainly eminent domain is something that is out there that happens, but we, I would, you know, we would do everything possible to not do that. I mean, we could even talk about rerouting the road a little bit if we needed to. So that's not a for sure thing. And uh, a conversation, you start a conversation, you try to negotiate, that's the way things start. And. Uh, again, no one is going to jump right to eminent domain. I can promise you that. Yeah. And I know that, um, and I addressed this with Mark at a, in a recent episode about the ongoing cost of the structure. Once it's built, you know, what, yeah. what kind of impact is that going to have on taxes and, and the city's budget? Yeah. Uh, so that's a question, or that's, uh, people are telling us that we're not transparent mm -hmm. in, in that. So uh, just so we... So everyone is on the same page. Uh, this sheet that I'm uh, looking at right now, and, and again, Monty, hopefully we'll be able to get this up on the mm -hmm. screen. But in our budget book for this budget work session, uh, we, our staff does a great job of laying out a narrative for our budget. And in that, in that set of documents, there was a, a, uh, there was a paragraph entitled Estimated Operating Subsidy. So it talks about community centers, recreation centers often serve as loss leaders for communities, which means they have significant value for the community. However, they often require an operating subsidy. For instance, in the case of the community center, the uh, fiscal year 23-24 budget projects $136,000 in operating expenses, and it generates approximately $22,000 of Revenue. So obviously, there's a hundred and ten thousand dollars subsidy to run the community center, Boss Landon, all of those. So in in the case, uh, so staff and the city's financial advisor, Micah Maloney, complete a pre preliminary pro forma for the pro proposed indoor recreation center. In formulating the pro forma, staff tried to take a conservative approach, estimating revenues. 
Furthermore, the initial analysis should not be mistaken for a market feasibility study. Other, rather, this initial analysis was is intended to provide initial operating budget projections. And so this was an internal, done by staff, did some research with other uh, rec centers around, you know, looked at <coughs> fees collected, costs, and all of that. So the conclusion was, and this is what we discussed in our budget, so no one can tell me they couldn't have known. Right, and I... Thinking back, I'd forgotten about that too, but yeah. yes, that was, that was discussed. And so, yeah. and the conclusion was, overall, staff believes the indoor rec center will require an operating subsidy of approximately a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. There it is. It's in black and white, so you cannot tell me we weren't transparent with that it was going to make projected costs, and obviously projection is a projection, Yeah. but a projected a subsidy required by the city of $500,000. Now, in this particular case, we also made note that we would be closing our current indoor uh, swimming pool yes. when we have a new pool. This last fiscal year, the cost to operate, the subsidy it took to operate the indoor swimming pool was $339,000. Mm -hmm. So we have basically what we have with the new rec center opening with a new pool, the old mm -hmm. pool closing, is a $161,000 additional subsidy for the swimming pool. We believe that we, as a city, that will work very easily in our budget because <coughs> these types of projects and the pool and the rec center especially generate other revenues for the city that aren't directly retied, tied to it. We also have done a study and again, that's all available. A uh, company, I think it was Ballard, it's called, did a study of what kind of additional revenue in the community that this center would do. And they conservatively, with, with uh, some basketball, volleyball tournaments, with $5 million. So you add $5 million of economic activity into the city of Pella, that's pretty nice. That's going to create a lot of sales tax. It's going to take a lot of... Uh, local op or uh, hotel motel tax mm -hmm. it's uh, restaurants uh, you know all those things it's going to help so when somebody says we aren't transparent facts are facts this was in our budget we talked about it if you didn't see it and you don't know about it that's on you not the city of Pella it was out there for anybody that wanted to see it and just on a note there, we also have another consulting firm that is in the process of doing a more detailed one of these so that we get some outside, say, and we don't know, it's not done yet, but once it's done, it'll be out there available. They may come back and say, hey, it's only going to be a $200,000 mm -hmm. subsidy. Maybe it's going to be seven hundred. I don't know. But they will do that for us, and that's in process. And, of course... You want to build this because Pella Corp and Vermeer, I'm, I'm don't mean to single them out, but they've been vocal yeah. and they've committed money because they want to bring more and youthful workers here to Pella to live here. Um, but how can you, how do you intend to balance, you know, bringing in those tournaments that are going to bring in more money and the uh, use of, you know, the average Pella folks that just want to go play in a gym or go yeah. swim in the pool? Oh, I think if you talk to any, uh, a, a facility like this, that's, it's a, it's a balancing act mm -hmm. and it's, it takes someone with some real knowledge how to make, because if you think about it, uh, you know, we've been told by the schools, uh, there's a large youth aquatic program, so their schools will have swimming programs. Schools also are very interested in having the ability to use the gym space. Uh, uh, so all those things are gonna factor in, so it'll, it'll take some real management of the facility, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And there will be de times designated. I could see times designated for uh, practice from 3 to 5.30 on a couple of basketball floors or in the pool mm -hmm. or whatever. And then there will be other times that are open. So, uh, yes, it's not going to be 100% available to everybody 100% of the time. Right. I would be lying if I said mm -hmm. that. But uh, the best effort will be made to accommodate everybody that, that wants to use the facility. And make no mistake about it. This type of a facility will be used by every age group that lives in the city of Pella. Uh, with an indoor walking track for uh, people that like to walk, 
in the winter time, it will be a busy place. It'll be a, a very active and busy place, and and uh, great amenity to the community. <clears throat> and you mentioned the school district. Um, they they did not make a donation. You went and asked. I was not at that meeting, so I, yeah. I don't, But um, what I was told was that the the uh, board passed on it, and the reason why was because. Of course, the board is currently in the middle of their own big projects with right. the Early Learning Center, the bridge, and and they just finished the, the tennis courts. So w what happened there? What? Yeah, well, you kind of said it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, hopefully I'm not wrong, I think it's like $56 million mm -hmm. that they're in the process of spending right now yeah. between the Early Learning Center, the bridge between the two schools and the tennis court. So yes, they were mm -hmm. they were in they loved the project. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the supervisors got some really nice emails from a bunch of the administration at the school uh, from the school, you know, administration and school board members and that uh, because they loved the project. They know that it would be a great benefit for the district. They're not in a position right now to make a financial contribution, right. mm -hmm. but the, we will continue to have more uh, discussion with the schools about some kind of, uh, you know, user fee or something, depending how much they want to use it and that kind of thing. So we will continue to have that discussion. And of course, in Opapala, we, we currently share our swimmers with Newton. Yeah. And obviously, um, there might be more swimmers in Marion County who can do a sharing agreement with Pella and join as well. So yeah, I think you know. And again, I'm not an expert in swimming, but the swimming people that uh, are involved talk about this large aquatic uh, club that does a lot of goes to Newton, and they say that if they have the availability of a practice facility in town, that group would grow. And I, mm -hmm. and as I said, the schools have said they would start swimming programs. We've talked to Central College about the same thing. They're doing some research. They've done some research. I think there's six other colleges in the conference that have swimming programs, and so they're looking at it and wondering, you know, if they should start a swimming program. So that's that stuff's all being discussed. And I recently, we did recently did an episode with Eric Van Clay, and Van, and he mentioned that too that he might be interested in finding more programs to utilize the facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they definitely would be a user also. Mm -hmm. So what more would you like folks to know about the rec center? Be reminded of, yep. actually. So. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, uh, some a thing that I keep hearing is this transparency issue that we've mm -hmm. not been transparent. And I, I just, the facts do not back that up. So I want to share some of the facts. So I, again, I'll have these slides. Hopefully will be on the screen so you can see them. But the first initial time we started talking about any kind of a facility was on April 19 of 2022. Mm -hmm. and, and we put out a, a $45 million facility plan. Yes. Okay. And at the time, the indoor rec center was $31 million. The University Street Extension was $6 million. We put $5.5 million into the, at the time we committed 5.5 to the community center for renovation and then a $2.5 million um, just contingency to get to the 45 million. And then right next to that, in our presentation, we have funding sources, okay? Local option, tax, bond, or general, a local option or a GO bond, $17 million. Right. We have never wavered from that. Every conversation I have had in public, we have had as a council, we, our plan is to put $17 million of a bond that will be funded by 50% of the local option sales tax that we anticipate receiving over the next 20 years. $5 million of cash on hand and $23 million of donations and other, you know, at, the, at this county would be part of that, yeah. some of the schools, all those things that we talked about. Uh, and, and, and then also on that same slide, we show that cash, the city's contribution is $22 million to these projects, $5 million cash on hand, $17 million local option tax. So I don't know how you can misinterpret that or how it, it seems like that's not transparent. I don't know. Okay, so that's how things started. 
We did that on April 19, 2022. We also had the same slide on September 6 of 2022 when we were talking about extending the local option sales mm -hmm. tax, okay? So we did that on September 6, uh, local op talked about the local option sales tax. Okay, January, which we're extending it, it as most people know, it, yeah. it expires, would have expired in December of this year, 2023. We voted to extend it uh, January 2024 to December 40, uh, 2043. Yes. And 50% infrastructure, 50% uh, quality of life projects and then we had an estimate of the and that was on September 6 on June 21 we rolled out the proposed uh, ballot language and again it'll be on the screen talks about and if you talk about transparency right in the ballot it says property tax relief zero so mm -hmm. that was in there and that of course created quite a storm but don't tell me we weren't transparent. It said right in the ballot, zero. Mm -hmm. And then indoor rec, other facilities, all those types of things. Uh, and then right here that said, all financial plans for the proposed indoor recreation facility and community center improvements have included significant allocations from lost collection to offset the impact of debt. So you can't tell me that we didn't talk about the lost money going towards this project. And so it just, uh, it, it doesn't hold water. The, the, the uh, narrative that we have been not transparent, haven't told uh, what we're doing is just not true. It's there. We've talked about it publicly. It's reflected in all our minutes and, and, and that. So, you know, I don't know what else to, I don't know how else I could <laughs> say it clearer or show it clearer. Than, than the actual minutes of our discussions. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, we, were, the, we were told if you don't pass it, you lose it. Well, that's true. If we didn't pass it, we wouldn't have it. Right. Now, I know we could come back and do it again if it wouldn't have passed the first time, but when we put it on the ballot, it's either pass it and extend it or you lose it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know, you know what else you can say about that. Um, and, as, and the thing you have to remember about the lost tax, the community as a whole approves it through a, a referendum vote, but city council has sole discretion on how to spend it once it's collected. So uh, city council, any city council moving in the future can decide how they want to spend it. Uh, so. And um, we're just about out of time here, but I also want to mention, you know, the uh, the 14 million in private donations already secured. Is that still an accurate figure, or have you got any? Uh, yeah, I think I said it yesterday. I think as of yesterday morning, uh, there was 41 entities, individuals, mm -hmm. and we were at 14, just shade under 15 million. But the good news is, when I got home yesterday or got back on my telephone, I had a uh, or my email, I had an email from another entity that pledged 50 thousand more. So it's happening. We've been out fundraising. People are excited about the project, and they are stepping up with their checkbooks and saying, "Yes, we will support this." So it's up to 42 now, mm -hmm. with 14 million seven hundred and some thousand dollars. All righty. Well, we'll leave it at that. And of course, you know, if, if we need to discuss this further, we'll do another episode someday. So. More than happy to do it. Absolutely. So well, thanks a lot for yeah. having me. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Thank you all for tuning in.